this is already our longest episode ever by far. By far, yeah. <laughs> but do you want to run through our Christopher Nolan rankings real quick? Yeah, I think uh, I mean now's a good time. We we've we've seen them all, so you know there, there's no way it'll pop up again on our on our podcast. So do you want right. to do um do you want me to go first or you go first or do you want I'm happy to go first? So you mentioned tennis ha- tenant has its faults. Uh to me, absolutely, and it's the worst Nolan movie. That being said, it's the worst Nolan movie at three stars, so hardly a disaster. I just found it inaccessible. Uh, kind of boring. And I think John David Washington, who I really liked in Black Klansman, was the wrong choice for the role of the protagonist in this movie. He just came off as kind of wooden to me. And it was going to be a tough road for anyone with this script because it just felt pretty removed. But that's number 12 out of 12 for me. Where do you have Tenet on your list? Yep. Tenet on my list comes in uh, also close to the bottom. It's at number 11. Uh, okay. Well. So what do you think of Tenet? Um, I think it's, I, I like it. I think visually it's very neat. I think the opening is, is really cool. I like Robert Pattinson in it. I think, you know, it's got some really cool visual stuff in it. I liked it a lot more once I saw it at home and had the subtitles on because that one was really hard to understand in the theater. Um, I, I don't think it has, there, there's no attachment to it that I have like to the other Nolan movies, but I think visually it's really neat. And um, I, I did enjoy, I, I thought I like John David Washington enough in it. And like, I really like Robert Pattinson. So yeah, I thought I have it at four stars, but that seems a little high, maybe more of a three and a half. Speaking of three and a half, I have following at number 11 uh, with three and a half stars. Um, I think it's a great first feature. It's not a great movie, but I think it's a great first go. And I think it has, like I mentioned this earlier, but it has a lot of hints to what Nolan would be interested in later. What it doesn't have are great performances. Jeremy Theobald, Alex Haw, Lucy Russell, fine, but they feel like low budge indie actors because they are. And that's what you get. Um, so yeah, that's number 11 for me. Where do you have following? Uh, following, I have it at number twelve, so we're we're pretty pretty close there. It's uh, yeah, three. I also at three and a half stars. A very good, very good for a first movie, but yeah, it's it's a it's a first movie, you know. Sure, I have at number ten, The Dark Knight Rises. Now, the first time I saw this movie, like I said, was at the end of I'd already seen five hours worth of movies in the theater. I'd watched Batman Begins and Batman and The Dark Knight, uh, and then I watched The Dark Knight Rises. Now, I've seen it since then, but I think this movie's kind of bloated. I don't think a lot of it makes sense. And now that Oppenheimer's come out, we have a, a a second, better Christopher Nolan atomic bomb movie. Not essential viewing, The Dark Knight Rises. But what I will give it is that it is the satisfying final few scenes and conclusion to that Batman story. Where do you yeah. have The Dark Knight Rises? Uh, 100% spot on. Agree with all that. I also have it at number 10. I have it ranked at four stars. Um, it's definitely a step down from the other two. But yeah, satisfying at the end. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's solid. It's just, um, yeah, it's not... Uh, it's not, I mean, the other two set a pretty high bar. Totally. I think you'll probably have the same number nine as me. I have insomnia at number nine. I also have insomnia at number nine, but that being said, I really like it. I think it's good. I think Al Pacino is really good. It's more subdued. We've talked about Pacino a lot on this podcast, I think. And this is another one of his uh, insider, like subdued performances where he's not doing the, the Al Pacino freak out stuff. And uh, Robin Williams is really kind of subdued and a little menacing in this too. And it's a really good, probably my favorite Robin Williams performance actually. So, I mean, yeah, it's still coming in at number nine, but I, I think it's a really good movie. Uh, I agree with everything you just said. You have it at four stars. I have it at three and a half. I haven't seen it in many years. I think I'll probably rewatch it pretty soon. Yeah. I saw this in theaters and was really taken by it in theaters. Although thinking about it now, it's funny how Hillary Swank has very little to do in this movie where her character actually should be very, very important because she is the actual protagonist of the movie. Yep. It's actually quite similar to her role in Logan Lucky. Oh, come yeah. to think of it. Um, another movie that I think is about as good as Insomnia. It's the only movie that Nolan directed but didn't write, which is, I think, interesting oh, yeah. and uh, worth noting. And number eight, now I think this is where we start to jumble up a bunch. And number eight, I have Dunkirk. Yep. So I've only seen Dunkirk in the theater and I didn't much like Tenet, although not to the same extent. I didn't feel an emotional attachment to pretty much any of the characters except for Barry Cogan. And he doesn't have a ton of screen time. And that's because this is, I think maybe more than any other Nolan movie, this is really an ensemble movie. Yeah. And at times it felt like it was spread a little too thin. And at times I felt like the different timeline thing wasn't doing anything for the movie. In fact, I don't even know if I realized that there were different timelines until after the movie was over and I read about it. That being said, it's pretty compelling. Um, everyone puts in a great performance. Mm-hmm. Harry Styles, I think this might be his debut performance and it's his best so far. I think so, it was, yeah. And I remember people lost, like freaked out about it too. And he was he's not even in the movie very much. 
No. And, and it's uh, honestly, it's only been downhill from there. So go back and enjoy Dunkirk because it's the best we're going to get from him. Probably. I don't think his turn as Thanos's brother in the MCU is going to top what he did in Dunkirk. Not so much. I have Dunkirk at six. Um, oh, and so that's not too where, far. yep, not too far, but that is where six is where the five star ratings start for me. Six to one are all five stars for me. I gave Dunkirk five because I really liked it when I saw it in the theater. And then I've watched it a couple of times at home since then. And, and I, I actually really like the divergent timelines. And uh, I, I think the sound design is just incredible. And just some of the visuals of it and, and everything. Yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty great. I think it's a top tier uh, war movie. Cool. I gave it three and a half, but I'm willing to watch it again. In fact, I'm going to be watching a lot of these again because Annie has not seen like any of these. Oh, nice. except, except Memento, which she saw like 25 years ago. So uh, we're going to be revisiting a lot of these because she was also blown away by uh, Oppenheimer. Yeah, my wife and I just did the Nolan series last year. So we went through a similar thing and it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Cool. Um, and number seven, I have Interstellar, which I like a lot, a lot, a lot. I gave it four stars. I, I really like it. I, I think some of the ending is just, it's like trying to be 2001, but not quite hitting it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love the way this, just the sci-fi looks. The only movie that's doing what this movie does that I like the look of better, and I don't like the movie better, but I like the look of better is Ad Astra, where it has just like really stripped down sci-fi visuals. But Interstellar is a much more engaging movie than Ad Astra, although they're both about weird dad and kid relationships and how that relationship spans the stars. Yeah, some of the conceits are dumb. On the other hand, this has Jessica Chastain, and I want her to be my other wife. So yeah, <laughs> it also has can't. Casey Affleck. Oh, there's that. It also has Timothy Chalamet as Casey Affleck. That's right. Yep. <laughs> so there's that. I have Interstellar pretty close to that. I have it at number eight. That's four and a half for me. I do, I, I think it's, yeah, it's really great. great. I, I really like McConaughey in it. Visually very cool. Uh, the, uh, the planet, the different designs of the planets is really cool. The surprise Matt Damon performance, you know, again, going back to Matt Damon, this is like the one movie or one of the few movies where he's just like a total dick and, and, and just like, when really, he's still being he, Matt Damon while still being Matt Damon. You know, uh, he, I don't know how he does it. Like he just does it, folks. But yeah, I think um, Interstellar is great. So it's my number eight. Yeah. At number six, I have Inception. Also, love this movie. Not sure it makes sense. Not sure that any of it... Uh, I, I, look, the A to B of the plot works, but I'm not sure that the whole bit about is he in a dream or isn't he makes a lick of sense. Although I was walking my dog this morning and I started thinking, well, maybe the ending's about how it doesn't matter whether you're in a dream or not if you get what you need in the dream like what is reality even so but I'll, again i'll be rewatching this uh because it's been a couple of years few years um and also we, i mean we have to just acknowledge that the visuals were groundbreaking and movies don't look this good anymore movies look like crap i mean oppenheimer looked this good but in general effects movies don't look this good another issue i had of mission impossible 7 the train scene at the end of that movie looked poorly composited nothing looked poorly composited in inception in part because they did a lot of it for real i have inception at number two it's absolutely one of my favorite. It's like a like a top tier favorite movie for me. I saw it. Uh, I was actually working at a movie theater when it came out. And remember, we all stayed up till I think it was like midnight or twelve thirty. By the time we got the theater closed, and you know, we all stayed up to watch it together. We even did a special screening. I saw it like a week after that. I've probably watched it six or seven times you know in the last 10 years or whatever since it's come out and i love it i you know i love like i said the visuals of it movies still don't look that good performances are amazing i mean dicaprio joseph gordon love it tom hardy ken watanabe killian murphy who we've talked a lot about elliot page marianne cotillard i think is is really great in the movie because she's not even like she's really not even playing a real person uh you, you know so it's kind of a it's really an interesting performance for, for someone who has trouble with female characters like we've acknowledged um i think this is a really interesting uh, character and i think marion cotillard's really good in it and i yeah i love it i love the i love the score you know i love the like the the, the, the songs they use for the kick you know just just all that stuff does it make sense eh, maybe not all the time but oh and, and michael kane too as as the dad and and when you said to um you just hit on like the ending you know about you know, is he the dream? Is he not? I mean, the point is, and I think I've heard, I read that Nolan has said this finally too. It's like, the point is that Cobb, the character, he doesn't care anymore. And that's the story arc. It's, you know, everybody wants it to be like, well, is he or isn't he? Is it a dream or is it not? That's, that's not the question. You know, the question is, does this character care anymore? He does not. So right. I, I think it's great. I love it. I am willing to revisit, although I'm willing to revisit. I have it at four stars. It's not like I dislike the movie at all. I just uh, yeah. I just have some some questions. Oh, I, I also think it's really worth noting, until the Venom movies came out, this was the only time it looked like Tom Hardy was having any fun in a movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love Mad Max, but he does he smile in any movie aside from this and Venom? I'm not sure. 
Not that I can think of. Okay, at number five, I have, now this is where I flip the script for most folks, but I have The Dark Knight at number five. And you'll notice I have not said Batman Begins yet. So I like The Dark Knight a lot. I think Heath Ledger's performance is unreal. I think Christian Bale is killing it as Batman. I think that Maggie Gyllenhaal is a better Rachel than Katie Holmes. I don't think the Aaron Eckhart stuff works in the third act. There's a scene where Joker is infiltrating an elite party and Batman just leaves. And they don't resolve that. Yeah. That's a that's just bad plotting. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, it is one of the better crime movies that have been made. Joker is a really menacing villain and a really compelling one. And the scene with the two boats is incredible. And the and yeah, the the truck chase down the highway is incredible. Yeah. And everything Heath Ledger, Ledger does is incredible. And Michael Caine begging Batman not to do the wrong thing as always is incredible. I mean, it's 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 a it's a great movie. I just think Batman Begins is better. Right, we're talking about that. Yeah, Dark Knight I have is uh, is number three, and I agree with everything you said about it. I love it. You know, Joker is an amazing villain. I mean, that's an all timer right, right there. And I mean, what a I mean, what a loss. You know that uh, that that was the last thing. Uh, well, other than part of Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, but that's... Let's pretend that movie doesn't exist. It's completely unfinished. I mean, it's not, you know, it's it's not what we would have gotten had he, you know, had he we not lost him. So um, so for all intents and purposes, yeah, this was kind of the last thing we got. And just what, just what an amazing performance. I mean, it's just one that, it was one of those ones that, you know, as soon as you saw it right immediately after you saw it, you're like, this is, you know, it, it's like, it's an all-timer. You knew it right away. And I think it's... I think it's great. I love Christian Bale in it. Um, I mean, everyone, yeah, like you said, Maggie Gyllenhaal is a better Rachel uh, than, than Katie Holmes was. I like the Aaron Eckhart stuff a little bit more. I've always been probably a bigger Aaron Eckhart fan than most people. I've always kind of had, uh, he, he's always kind of been my guy. So yeah. You're a big thank you for smoking fan. I love Thank You for Smoking, um, but the real, the movie I really fell in love with him as an actor is this movie called In the Company of Men. It's a very early Neil LaBoot movie, and he's shockingly evil in it, and uh, it's it's a really great performance. So that's you know another another podcast for another time. But uh, yeah, Dark Dark Knight is number three on my list. Great great movie, great crime movie, great comic book movie, just just a great movie. Period. Christopher Nolan, also a huge fan of In the Company of Men, but just in his life. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> okay, so at number, what was that? That was number five for me. At number yep. four, I have Batman Begins. So everything up to now has been three, three and a half, four. This is my first four and a half star Nolan movie. This is a Christopher Nolan movie. It's much more than it's a Batman movie. It's a Nolan movie. It has asynchronous, multiple timelines going on. It has a great villain in Killian Murphy and a great villain in my arch enemy, Liam Neeson. It's just a strong, I don't even want to say an origin story because it's about this like trainer student relationship that they have the whole movie only for him to be betrayed at the end. That was a relationship that I could really sink my teeth into. Now, don't get me wrong. Joker and the Batman works in The Dark Knight. It works super strongly. But I found Batman's upset at the people who trained him being the people who are trying to ruin his town and have been through this psychopath scarecrow played by Killian Murphy the whole time. Just a really, really compelling twist. It also hammered home in a way that set up the Dark Knight really well. The Batman doesn't kill mythology. And it didn't have weird editing problems or a third act fall off. Uh, there's not a third act fall off or a third act. I don't know. I just find that the, the whole like uh, Commissioner Gordon two-faced scene doesn't work for me. And there's nothing like that in the Dark Knight. Katie Holmes is not great in the movie. I don't think she's bad either, but she's, it's like, it feels a little Dawson's y to me. And to be fair, she's, she's acting opposite uh, Christian Bell. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is also just a crazy, great performance by Christian Bale, which, whereas The Dark Knight is much more of a Heath Ledger movie and The Dark Knight Rises is a Tom Hardy movie, probably to its detriment because it's hard to understand what he's saying and the, and his motivation doesn't really make sense. Mm-hmm. But you get a Christian, you get Christian Bale as the focal point of your movie for over two hours. It's, it's probably going to be great. Yeah. Um, unless it's the blue eye, whatever Netflix thing that came out that was boring. Oof. Yeah, that was uh, rough to get blue eye. No. We, we I saw did. a trailer was, and I got bored. Yeah, we did. It was hard. It was hard to get through. Batman Begins is my quintessential Batman movie. That is my Batman. I have it at number five. Uh, so it's just below the Dark Knight at, at number three. I I they're so close for me. I love you know all the things I said about Dark Knight. I could I could say most of the same things about Batman Begins. I mean, all the stuff you said, I, I agree with all that. I think Liam Neeson is great. Ken Watanabe as like the uh the proxy the fake, the uh, villain. Fake. Yeah, like for most of the movie, you know, I really love him. He's great. Just the, the whole thing again, his relationship is building with Michael Caine. All of that is great. I mean, I love Batman Begins. I mean, I, I if pressed, I probably do choose the Dark Knight, just probably based on Joker. 
um, more than anything, but I Batman Begins, it's it's really close for me. I think they're both, uh, I just think they're both phenomenal, uh, great, great movies, and it's hard to pick uh, between the two of them. And I think the first one is the one where it has my favorite Christian Bale line in the entire series. I think it's really early on. Um, he he's accosting some bad guy somewhere and he's trying to interrogate him about something and the guy says you know oh, i don't know anything i swear to god and christian bill's goes, swear to me it's like a goosebump moment you know like okay and that was like and that was really early in the first movie so at that point i was like all right this is the batman we're getting and like and that's the batman he was for the rest of the the series and i thought it was awesome yeah it's an all-time great batman line the other thing that batman begins has that the dark knight doesn't have or rather other way around, a problem that the Dark Knight has that Batman Begins doesn't have is a problematic, I'm trying to be political in this modern, in the time that I'm in moment where Batman surveils the whole city illegally because only he can be trusted with this horrible surveillance. And it was a and it was a commentary on the Patriot Act, but it was a commentary on the Patriot Act that made it seem like George Bush was right. So like buzz off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he destroys it at the end. You know what? George Bush didn't do that. So, yeah. Eh, whatever. Anyway, at number three, I have the Prestige. Great movie. I have it at number seven, which Ooh, feels it's low. low. Low, but I love it. You know, like I, I love it. I love the movies that are above it too. But yeah, I mean, that's it's a hard ranking to do. But yeah, I love the Prestige. I think it's great. So I fell in love with Christopher Nolan in earnest after seeing the Prestige. I didn't see. I think maybe I did see the uh, spoiler for the Prestige. I'm pretty sure I did see the twin twist coming. But the various turns that the movie takes to get there and after that, you can't guess. And if you can, it's still great because of the Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale performances are out of this world. Again, the women are sort of given short shrift. Scarlett Johansson doesn't have a ton to do. Rebecca Hall doesn't have a ton to do. She's amazing. She's so and, good, yeah. And she just doesn't, she's not given that much. But David Bowie tears it up for a minute. So good. Uh, Andy Serkis tears it up for a minute. Michael Caine, as always, the, the emotional center of a Christopher Nolan movie. I just love it. And it also, part of it is they came out the same time as The Illusionist, a really boring Edward Norton movie about a magician. Yep. It just mopped the floor with it. So, it And I like that. that movie, The Illusionist, but I mean, in a head-to-head -head competition, it's, I mean, there is none, you know. I didn't care for that movie, even though I love Jessica Biel. I just didn't didn't care for it much. I think that this whole thing, the trope, I've seen this in both crime movies and heist movies and con men movies. If your big twist is going to be that you're going to give a woman a drug or a man a drug that's going to make it seem like their heart has stopped to trick someone, that's lazy. That's a lazy <laughs> yeah. trick. I don't like that. <laughs> um, it's like time travel or making a television character pregnant to amp up the tension. I just think that uh, it's yeah. a lazy shortcut. Number two, I have Memento. Memento, I have at number four. But uh, again, those top four for me are, are all so close. I love Memento. That was, and obviously that was the one that came out right after following. So Memento for a lot of us would have been the first Nolan movie that we ever saw. And it just blew me away right away. I mean, according to Letterboxd, it is the first Nolan movie that basically everyone ever saw. If you were born at that time, if you, we were teenagers when that movie came out. Okay. So when you talk about our generation of young men, boys really at the time, what are the big staples of our adolescence and young adulthood? I know you don't like this, but Fight Club. Yeah. And, definitely. and Memento and Seven like, and I mean, that those are the ones, right? Those are like the big high school, like, holy crap. The usual suspects, maybe. The usual suspects was a big um, one for me and my friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Memento's uh, right up there and probably the best of them. Just a super tight, really, you know, it's, it's, it's shorter than any other movie, Nolan movie, except the following or following. Mm -hmm. I mean, following is barely an hour. The, the editing is perfect. You can play a game on the DVD. Uh, version and get it in chronological order. Don't watch it that way. It's not interesting that way. Watch it the way that it was made. It also does the black and white versus color. We didn't say this, but Nolan has said that the black and white scenes in Oppenheimer are meant to be objective while everything that's in color is open to interpretation, which I said that to Annie and she was like, yeah, duh, you didn't have to tell me that. It's like, okay, I guess it worked. She got um, the moment. Yeah, she got it. Um, in Memento, it's the scenes in black and white are moving forward and the scenes in color are moving backward and they meet in the middle and it's beautiful. And I, until Oppenheimer came out, I was like, no one never topped Memento, but then Oppenheimer came out and that's my number one movie. Oppenheimer. Yes. I also have Oppenheimer at number one. I mean, it just, it's the best of, it combines so many different things of, of, of the, of the movies he's already made. Like now that we've talked about them all, I mean, it's got the, you know, the kind of the black and white and color uh, dichotomy that, that he did in Memento. It's kind of got that three different 
timeline editing thing that he had in you know dunkirk it's got the visuals that he's known for in you know inception and interstellar got these great visuals it's got the big music you know the 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 gigantic musical scores that he's had before it's kind of just this culmination of of everything that he's done i mean he's what really he's done is he's combined like some of the good traits of like the great directors like you can see uh like you can see influence from like kubrick and uh terrence malick and even like steven spielberg you know like some of the way like he can he marries the big blockbuster and the artistic success arguably better than anyone since spielberg probably has has done it i mean to make movies that have been successful as the dark knight but also just as artistically lauded and successful as you know as, as oppenheimer has proved to be and as some of his other movies have proved to be i mean his career is it's remarkable and if it ended tomorrow i mean he'd still be one of the best yeah i mean you go out on oppenheimer that'd be terrific he won't he's only 52 years old he's probably got a good 10 15 maybe 20 years of good movies in him for me i'm glad tenet was just a blip although we'll see he might go back to sci-fi next because he seems to be doing that now who knows uh i'm really excited to see what he does next